So you're ready to start the hearing? I'll play the hearing officer, so I know nothing about the facts. Um, I, once we start, I'll have you go around the room, introduce yourself by name, and then who you are in this scenario. Um, and then we'll be starting actually with Richard and Davida first, since you're the DCF people that um, supported the 51A. Then we'll go to the school people, Lester, Jeremiah, and John. Um, and lastly, to the parents and their counsel. And then we may come back again, you know, depending on, um, this is not a court hearing, it's well, an agency. Allow me to get to the Superior Court hearing? Yes, ma'am. Oh. That's part two. Yeah. <laughs> That's you, Ash, for the department, and Patricia for the parents. Now, when we do that one, Patricia and Ash, it, because your attorney's arguing a case, um, doing an oral argument before the trial court, before the Superior Court, you'll use the case law more than obviously, you know, in the agency hearing it's more of that, you know, I mean, it's shrouded in the, in, in certainly in the law and the regulations and all that, but the agency hearing is more fact-based, although the hearing officer still has a certain standard by which she's going to, you know, approve or not the initial 51A. And then from the agency hearing, we're assuming days have passed and um, the, uh, the tumors then have gone to the Superior Court. Okay, so that's, that's what we'll be doing today. And we should be able to get both of them in today. You have a question, Patricia? No? Ready? Is everybody ready? Okay. This is the uh, administrative hearing um, conducted today within the DCF offices. My name is Paul Caldas. I am an impartial hearing officer um, employed by the department. <laughs> and I'll be conducting uh, this particular hearing regarding the, the TUMAs and the DCF uh, support of the 51A of this family. So let's go around the room first. Introduce yourself. Tell me who you are. Yes, Supervisor. I am Ms. Freeman, the Supervisor for the Community Support. And your name is? Your name. That I can't find it. Your actual name. <laughs> oh, Patricia Campbell. Oh, that's, <laughs> that's me. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Katie Langan, the school nurse uh, to whom Imani was referred um, by his English teacher, Mr. Mark Thank you. Lester Madison. Now, Mr. Campos, you indicated that you are uh, Maria Freelander's uh, supervisor. Yes. Um, it's just a, a and obviously she's uh, um, more cognizant of the, of the particular facts of this case, but you um, did approve the support of the uh, 51A, correct? Yes. Is there anything else that you can um, tell this officer? Ms. Freelander uh, did the investigation, mm -hmm. found just cause for the 51A report. When I looked at it, most of those, most of, most 51A situations, uh, especially in medical neglect, neglect cases, have to do with serious life-threatening illnesses. And I did have a question as to whether this rose to that level. But in the totality of the circumstances, I felt it did. I had it reviewed by the Northeast clinical team, and they concurred okay. that the totality of the circumstances, this could have a severe effect on the child, both physical and emotional well-being. And that's why I signed off on the report. Okay. Now, Ms. Freelander, if you could go through the chronology. Okay, um, so Jamil, who is a student, well, he was a student um, because of his health, so he had to go, um, he had to go like 
Could you please phrase it in terms of your investigation? Oh, in well, other words, when, when well, you first received the 51A and then who you, what sources you talked to and whatnot. Okay, well, as, after we, um, we got a report from the school that um, he was sick and he wasn't receiving any treatment, um, we followed up the 51A, um, I mean, 51B investigation report. Um, we went to um, the, the house, we spoke to the parents, and they insisted that um, he did not need medical treatment, that they were following the rituals of the Hindu religion, um, where they would, um, he said, like, pray over him to, to be um, healed. Um, as far as things that struck our interest were the fact that there were animal sacrifices um, going on in, in the home, and that was what brought attention. back to you for more detail, but okay. uh, let, let me, um, Mr. Um, McIntosh, okay. yeah, the police vice principal, and Ms. Um, 40 for 6, I'm sorry, you called in, in the 51A, correct? Yeah, I mean, when, when Langdon, uh, when the nurse, you know, first approached me, obviously, uh, as the principal, when I, I wanted to make sure that the, that the school, myself, representing the school, was kind of making a unified front. So it's nice that, you know, she told it to me, and it kind of gives a second look from somebody that I can look at her facts objectively without having been influenced by seeing animal sacrifices or kind of seeing them, at least it all makes sense. And it, and it did add up to uh, you know, her conclusions that I thought was supported by the objective, what she saw objectively. Uh, specifically, I was concerned with her report that um, the parents were refusing medical care uh, for what I looked at as a very easily curable in today's modern age of medicine, a type of uh, condition, severe flu-like symptoms that we, our doctors can easily deal with very simply. So a lot of people disregard it as, as a serious illness type thing, but you know, if left untreated, these types of illnesses, the flu or not, they can kill people. So that concerned me. Um, her report that um, the children were suspect or subjected to watching animals getting sacrificed um, at such a young age, that bothered me from a, you know, a mental health trauma uh, point. Uh, it just, to me as a school, it definitely warranted getting the experts involved. And in this situation uh, falls under your mandatory reporting guidelines of the 51A? The police suspect there is harm being done to a child, yes. Okay, thank and you. neglect is a form of harm. Now, M Mr. Neely, or uh, Mr. Martino, mm -hmm. I, I think you may have been the person that sort of got the ball rolling here. Um, being um, the other child's teacher, and was it, and then it was you that reported to somebody else about yes. your concerns, so why don't you tell yeah. me about that? Um, well, I required the, um, we had an assignment which was an essay when the students returned from Christmas vacation, they were gonna talk about, they would each talk about their New Year, New Year's Eve or New Year's uh, tradition. And Chi-Chi mentioned the situation where um, there was this animal sacrifice and I believe that the animal being sacrificed was a goat um, and that raised questions for me about like health, the, the public health, and where where was the goat coming from? Was it coming from far away, or um, and what was going on in the ritual? So I, I looked up and I and I noticed that there was a lot of information and that this was a religion that's internationally recognized, but I didn't find a lot about animal sacrifice. So I I wanted to I mentioned it. Yes, uh, we were very fortunate to 
had Mr. Martineau, an outstanding teacher, and uh, he met with me and expressed his concern. And I, as I do with all faculty, it's people are concerned about a child. You know, meet with the teacher and meet with the child. And uh, I examined the teacher later that day. And uh, I'm getting confused now. T.G. is the, the girl who wrote the report for um, Mr. Martineau, but isn't Jamil the sick child? I, I did. Okay. I did examine Jamil too. Oh, okay. Yeah. But, oh, you, I'm sorry. So you spoke to T.G. at some point I as did. well? I oh. And I examined uh, Jamil, and I definitely had a sense that this has to go to a higher authority <coughs> because Jamil appeared to be neglected to me. So Jamil was sick. What, what were his symptoms? His when symptoms he were. So do you, I'm sorry, you only saw him once and then he went home and he was home for two weeks basically after that. Yes, but. I did inform the principal that I was concerned that this child was being neglected. I don't know what you mean by that. Well, his symptoms were, he didn't smell very good. Uh, he had a severe cough, postnatal drip, okay. flu-like symptoms. Um, kind of shivery, he was wearing a t-shirt, and it was right after winter recess. Uh, so was it you that sent him home, or did he go to your office saying he was sick and then ask to go home? I, uh, I, I sent him home with an ear infection um, and what appeared to be. Uh, just let me just interrupt for a second. You said I sent him home with an ear infection. Yeah, but I mean, you're not a doctor. How did you I'm not a doctor. I'm a nurse. But, it, but from examining him, as I said, he had the flu or appeared to be the flu. Mm -hmm. He had a elevated temperature. Um, I looked, checked his ears and his throat, and he didn't look good. He, looked quite ill and I, I so what happened after you sent him home well a week later uh, he returned to school and did not appear any better in fact he appeared to be deteriorating so I was concerned about that and uh, I thought of him as an at-risk child. And I don't understand, I did not understand why these symptoms had not improved when the standard operating procedure to treat these symptoms by a physician or is over the counter medication. Thank you, Ms. Lincoln. Mr. and Mrs. Tuma, I see you're both here today and we do have counsel with you as well and I'll hear from you as well but um, I, I, I'd like to hear from the both of you about you know your religion and your family and your practices and, and how Jamil is today how is he?
the um, school nurse, Ms. Lankin, actually called you um, a few days after to see how um, Jamil was doing. Mm -hmm. And um, I believe that you said that, that uh, he was still running with fever, uh, his left ear was still bothering him, which you know would, I guess, support that he maybe indeed ha did have um, an ear infection. And then Ms. Lincoln was really concerned about, and so am I, about the, the, this season's flu and how even possibly life-threatening it could be. But you just stated and that you ne never go to conventional medical doctors, no matter how sick, uh, Mr. Kuma? Um. I know your son is not that sick now, but that's right. not the issue right now. The issue is, you know, that I've got to decide is was that initial report um, supported? Is it substantially, you know, should I affirm that initial report that Ms. Freelander made when your son was, in fact, you know, quite ill? So um, I, I'm just wondering, do you ever go to doctors? Lewis, you're their attorney? Yeah. They, uh, you know, again, this isn't a formal hearing, so, right. you know, you know, hearsay comes in, everything does. Right. I'm just trying to ascertain whether that, uh, again, whether the 51A, uh, whether the Ms. Sorrell's, Ms. Um, Freelander's uh, uh, 51, the support of the 51A uh, is, should, be, should be affirmed or not. I, I know that we have to look at three perspectives, the child's interest, the parent, and the state's. And I mean, my clients, if they're religious, religious beliefs, um, which is a fundamental constitutional right, um, and, and that's just what they believe in, they believe that um, spiritual healing is the appropriate way. And so right now, it's in their eyes, there are no substantial facts them of abuse and neglect. Um, but at the same token, what I- What is the definition of abuse and neglect in terms of something like this? I, 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 I've heard from um, both of the department personnel here that um, in fact there may have been a lack of what's called routine medical care. And even though, I mean, I'm not, you know, your, your clients, appear to be very loving, devoted parents and you know, want to raise their children in their religion. But if, if, if there was a lack of, this, of routine medical care, doesn't that amount to neglect? Yes, according, I don't know if it's in this case, or maybe this case that I read for a, a colleague, but there is a, there are policies that are in place where each child, mm -hmm. uh, as a, as a way just to, of course, keep up with their medical records and their well-being, their, their health and safety, mm -hmm. that they should be tested every so often and that whenever certain symptoms and, and illnesses occur that mm -hmm. the parents ought to, I mean, they, they, they have to bring these kids for proper, proper, proper medical treatment. Um, and I think that's something Carly Kate said, that um, it talks about these policies that are in place um, for parents to abide by. And? Um, but you represent these parents. I represent these parents, yes. So, so that's the I'm not I'm just <laughs> understanding know, why you're bringing it up. I know, or I'm I know. bringing it up to distinguish I'm, that they somehow are accepted from this sort of policy.
waivers that can be done, but it doesn't appear that that's been done in this case because the issue has not been brought up. So I'm assuming that the parents do take them for their um, general medical and their inoculations are up to date. Um, the child just happened to have flu-like symptoms, so shouldn't sometimes children may seem like they have something that is not really significant. They may get better or worse within a short amount of time. But it, it just seemed like something that was fairly innocuous that wouldn't necessarily, out of 100 parents, uh, maybe only a few would take their children to a doctor for the same kind of symptoms that um, this child exhibited at school. Nurses are sending students home every day and they're not sent to the hospital or sent to a medical facility for evaluation. So what's your point to the department? So that it's are you for the department? Are you not, that they're are, are you a not little the department attorney? Oh no, sorry, parents. You are? I'm the department attorney. Oh, okay. Then then, I, then I understand your point. I'm sorry, <laughs> counsel. <laughs> um, Joe, you Wait. represent the department. So yes. it, how is it that and I saw in um Lang in, I'm sorry, Greenlander's report yes. said that what the parents uh, have done or not done um, seem to be they, they because of the lack of routine medical care, they, they subject the, the Jamil to a heightened risk of injury. But I'm hearing from um, their attorney that, that, that it seems to be not so, so serious a, a, a case. Kids are going to school every day, they have stuffy noses, now they don't always go to doctors. So I'm not sure how it falls within, you know, 51A and, and reasonable cause, sure. and ultimately reasonable cause, um, the, the 51A being supported. Yes. So what are your thoughts on that? Briefly in this case, uh, Madam Hearings Officer, uh, <laughs> with, with regard to the 51A, uh, the, the department is always going to view the light most favorable to the children. And in this case, uh, we were concerned by the, the neglect of the medical treatment and again, this was an ongoing basis that, that the children had flu-like symptoms that were severe at, at different points. And there is a substantial risk that, and, and this isn't a freedom or religious argument. I mean, certainly we realize that the parents do have a right to, to, to practice their portion of religion, which in this case involves animal sacrifices, et cetera. This isn't what this is about. This is about the children being placed in danger for lack of medical care. I mean, you know, if you have a child that has some flu-like symptoms, maybe some nausea and so on, it lasts a day or two and it goes away, um, then you know it's not so much of a problem. But if it's an ongoing basis, the children have these, these um, symptoms that are, that are, there may be something else at play here. And it's a comment for the parents to seek some sort of medical uh, advice. And, and certainly uh, in this case, we believe that that is detrimental to the health of the children. And again, we're looking at the children's best interest in this case. Whether it rises to the level of abuse, um, certainly there's some arguments there in either direction, but it certainly uh, rises to the level of neglect in this case. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to add a little bit. You said most of what I wanted to say. Okay. But um, again, we, we don't um, discriminate the fact that they want to practice their religion. But um, the fact that he's been home for several days and the um, the babalawa, which is the creek that they mm -hmm. go to, mm -hmm. is not available at the moment, this child is going to continue to suffer because he's away in South Carolina. He's not here to perform. Now, I'm looking at your, your report says this was not a medical emergency, but then you go on and say in your report that the animal sacrifice and other rituals could perhaps create the heightened risk of physical and emotion, emotional harm. So I'm wondering why and how you place the emphasis on the heightened risk on what appears to be um, different sorts of religious practices when the department al also has an obligation to, um, to include you know, all cultures and all ethnicities. So I, I'm just wondering about you know those statements in your report. Well, one reason is um, I, I don't remember if it was my um, my supervisor said it, but we don't know uh, we don't we're not against the fact that they have animal sacrifices, 
But again, we don't know where the animals are. We don't know if they keep the animals in the home um, or you know, like what is being done to get these animals. Also, the children being of young, the children being of young age um, might not be able to fully understand what's going on, that it's a sacrifice, the reason why it's being done. Um, this can, of course, give them emotional problems. What they're seeing animals being killed in front of them and being sacrificed, they don't understand what a sacrifice is at that age. And this is why we added that into the report. Again, we're not against the report. I'm sorry, how old are your children? Do you have the history of this channel? Um, 13 and um, 12. Do you agree with what the, the last statement that the no, uh, department chief just said about them not, your children not understanding? No, they do. They used to it. It's, you know, it's, a, it's, it's our culture, so they are used to it. So it just is a child on a farm walking Uh, Ms. Langton, I never heard from you before. Yes, uh, Madam Chair, uh, person. In Macaulay, the judge had a number of criteria for his decision. One of them was the likelihood of improvement with standard treatment. And in this case, if this little boy was given routine medical care, he'd be fine. And that was the basis of my recommendation. To see a doctor, get diagnosis, and be treated. That's the life threatening. Yeah, that McCall was a life threatening. And that is uh, true. Could you please acknowledge, uh, you know, raise your hand so I can acknowledge you, because I, I see lots of hands. That's all right, continue. continue. Oh, no, I mean, I'll, um, that was the <coughs> life threatening issue. So that was like far worse than food like syphilis. True. And that is yeah. an intention, you know, that's why the doctors were like, we need to do something because the likelihood of her surviving is really, really low. Again, th this, this hearing here is, is, is not so much conducted around legal arguments. I just need to get to the heart of the matter and make a decision whether, and all it is, and I think that Attorney Kelly hit it a little bit. Um, it's a very low threshold. Mr. And Mrs. Tuma, I want you to understand that all the department has done is um, supported that first report. It, you know, it doesn't mean that you're gonna lose custody of your child. Um, it doesn't mean that you can even you know, voluntarily work with the department. You might decide not to. Um, so, I mean, you're here because, you know, you've appealed that decision and you have a right to under the Fair Hearings Act, under the Administrative Procedure Act, but um, it, it's, it doesn't mean, uh, yes, it's serious in some sense, but um, it, it, the department might not go any further than this, especially where Jamil is back in school and seems to be doing, you know, okay. Um, one of you had your hand up earlier, I think, was it Richard? The department is not here to trample on the Tuma's religious rights or their parental rights. But the case of the matter is I'm in the hearing and I'm hearing that it's not a life-threatening medical condition. Nurse Langdon and the Public Health Commission have both stated that this is a flu epidemic. Okay. And we do hear in the news that people are dying of the flu this year. My question is to everyone uh, is, do we wait until Jamil has severe life-threatening illness and we neglect his treatment until that point and then we step in? That I think again it's the totality of the circumstances. We're looking at religious treatment versus medical treatment and I think we have to look at, I believe it was uh, minor one that said even though the children are supporting this type of religion and they're very voice, uh, boisterous in their support of the religion, we have to use a sub substitute judgment doctrine where we have to step in their place and then look at the best interest test and see what's in the best interest of the child. We're not denouncing their religion, we're merely stepping in and providing the necessary care before we get to the life threatening. But all you've done as the department is just supported a 51A report, that's it. The case has not gone any further than that and probably won't. Jamil's back in school, he seems to be doing okay. I, 
I get, I just wonder, and maybe some of the department people can, or the school people can clear this up. Um, and this is what I'm wondering about, you know, many school children um, do go to school sick, go home, stay out a few days, et cetera. And um, it, it, I'm, I'm not getting parents appealing um, 51A reports like crazy, yet uh, this particular case, that has a very, you know, may I say, Mr. Kusuma, unconventional religion attached to it, kind of raises a little bit of a flag to me. Um, I'd just, just like to hear from somebody from the department, Asher from the department. Yes, uh, my question is going to be directed towards the, the parents, and it's going to kind of piggyback what Richard said, but, and I think you brought this up earlier. leaving you alone after this initial report. Jamil Scott in school, the department has left you alone. So I'm wondering why are you going through this and you know, you hired a lawyer because that, that lawyer doesn't come free because there's no court action. So why did you do this? So if, we, if, if, the, if, the, if the parents are concerned that, okay, this is a, 
almost a moot point because after two weeks you don't Correct. get better. Uh, the next time one of the children is sick, the same attention will be brought, another 51A will be filed. Okay. Um, and it's a continuing process instead of verifying the fact that, okay, this family is, is very conscientious. Uh, mom has child care, uh, ch children in her child care um, in the home that are very well taken care of. They are attending to their children. They're very bright, they're very well kept, they're very well cared for, except there's this contention on the, on the style of medical practice that they have uh, for basic things for their children. So that's the point mm -hmm. of issue, which is breaching not only their constitutional rights but religious freedom, the right of privacy in, in their um, rights as parents to bring up their children the way they want, as well as other legal issues of, of being able to you know, treat your, your children medically um, as long as it's not the constitutional right to be the parent as well as in the medical issues, which there are numerous cases that could be cited regarding that. So it needs to be addressed and closure brought so that this doesn't continue to harm this family. All right. Madam Chair, could the department, in, in, are we going to do closing arguments for this? No, it, um, you won't. We'll do closing arguments. And you'll do arguments next. <laughs> When I, when I decide in your favor and you sure. go for the superior court. So this is an informal yeah. agency hearing, but I'll, I'll hear you wrap it up in terms of a conclusion. Okay. That's fine. So I just okay. want to reserve some time for that. Okay. Uh, well, why don't you do it now? Oh, fine. <laughs> uh, in this case, the department under the 51A has a very low burden, um, and it, it's clear that there are conditions in the totality of the circumstances that are going on here. That may endanger uh, the children. In fact, um, one of the things that was left out conveniently was the fact that the child had uh, strep throat. Uh, we know that the strep throat in this case is common. Children get it all the time, but it can also be harmful in that if uh, strep throat isn't treated, uh, in this case with antibiotics or medical attention, it can lead to further other ailments. It can cause uh, problems with your heart and so on and so forth. So, well, it's a minor thing, and you take that individually, say, hey, the child has strep throat. Millions of kids get strep throat every year, but if you have strep throat, you should be treated with antibiotics. In this case, the child wasn't even seen by a doctor. Um, so that combined with, we talked a little bit about the religious practices. Well, the department doesn't take a position on their specific religious practices. Some of the issues to do with the animal sacrifices that are going on there, the conditions of the animals in there, and you know, blood and so on and so forth, may present a health risk. There's a potential that that, that the animal oh, carcass. So, and just in my question, is it the fact that it's an animal sacrifice that no. scares you, no. or is it that it's become a, a, a substitute for uh, routine under the regulations medical care? I, I think I think it's it's again it's the. Totality, totality of everything together. It's not the specific religious practice, whether they sacrifice a, you know, a coyote or they sacrifice a, you know, a, a horse or whatever their thing is. Hey, Easter is coming up. Well, right. I mean, I, I mean, we'll be sacrificing a lamb. Sure. <laughs> the, the question is exactly, and, and the question is not the religious portion of it, but is this presenting a health risk? Is is there blood in there? Is there animal carcasses that are left in there? So on and so forth. That could potentially be something that would endanger the children. Not the specific practice of doing it, but maybe the after effect if it's left in there. I don't think it's so much of an emotional impact, if, especially if these children have been used to this growing up, but maybe the, the actual uh, biological aspect of having those animals around there may potentially cause um, you know, harm that may endanger the children. So, so that together we feel as though the, um, the, our agency has met the burden under 51A, which as you know is a low threshold. Again, DCS is not trying to trample on anyone's rights. The fact of the matter is, bloodletting was a widely accepted practice in the 16th century in Europe. If someone was here putting leeches on their son, I'm sure we'd have a problem with that. It's not the particular religion, it's the treatment instead of medical treatment. Uh, it's reason to believe that lack of routine medical care of Jamil puts them at substantial risk of physical injury. Although it sounds like threatening right now, you could have worsening of flu symptoms, fever, infection, strep throat, all things, as the attorney for DCS has said, require antibiotics, and they could result in a life-threatening illness. This, according to DCS,
ATF regulations constitute physical and or emotional neglect as defined by our standards. And we ask you to support the 51A report. Okay, who else do we have from the department that wants to be heard? Oh, well, you said workers, but. You're the workers. I was going to say the same I, thing, but I'll be um, social worker. Oh, yeah. That's all right. So, um, you again, I just wanted to um, say that, as my um, supervisor just said, um, without giving these children. Actually, I, I have a question for you. Sure. Uh, as the, the, in, the constituent the investigator, and you know your role as a DCF employee, and um, in terms of your training, um, understanding what the regulations mean, what the statute means, not so much case law because you know you're not an attorney, but how do you determine on a case by case basis um, what abuse and neglect is? Are you following you know a rubric? Are you using your own sort of um, interpretation of the definitions of abuse and neglect? Do you know what I'm asking? Yes. Here? Um, we follow the definitions of abuse and neglect. However, um, they're applied on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, okay. So could, is it possible that you might support a 51A report and, uh, you know, suppose your, your, your superior um, is equal with you and is also a 51B uh, uh, investigator, uh, is it possible that in the same situation, another worker might achieve, might come up with a different result than you do? Is that possible? It's possible. And I'll ask your superior as well. Is that possible? Because it's you've seen it. Yeah. most definitely possible. It's happened in other situations. But the people who were charged with this investigation are Ms. Freelander, and she conducted, according to my standards and the department standards, a very good investigation. Several people that interviewed with several people looked at medical documentation and she came to her result, which I concur. Thank you. Anyone else from the department want to be here? How about the school? So we support the department's decision um, to support the 51A report. Um, reasonable by the totality of circumstances in this case. Uh, the following factors. Jumping up and down now, <laughs> Mr. Tuma. I just have to mention that uh, although we talked about the uh, old medicine of leeches and how that was disapproved, mm -hmm. back in 2004, the FDA approved leeches as medical devices. So these things can help as the FDA. Did, did you just look that up? <laughs> that I do. Very educated man. It's the spirit of attitude we believe you know cure the power of the mind. Healing the body, when it's clouded with drugs and other things, it feels as though it can't be as effective as it would be if it was free to just work its own cure itself. Mr. Matthews from the school. The only the only other thing from the school that I'd like to throw out there for people claiming the uh, freedom of religion is that I couldn't find the records for these particular children, but uh, it's state regulation in almost all states, but certainly this one, that children have to have certain observations prior to being allowed into the public schools. And I would find it interesting if parents are willing to inoculate their kids to go to public schools, but then they turn around and say, you know, I think taking an over time of medicine to the school kind of seems like you go against your religion for one, but not for something else. That's something I would say to them. Okay, but that's really not at issue here in terms of, you know, whether they did or didn't. <coughs> well, it's whether I the, think the, it, this I, particular illness was a lack of... Uh, well, as far as a, a refusal for medical care, if they don't, if they don't want to go to routine, if they're unwilling to put their kids to routine medical care now, but were, mm -hmm. they're kind of kind of contradictory. Okay, thank you, Ms. Lewis. Um, I was this just popped into my mind as we as we're talking about this now, um, which I feel there's a close connection. What about you know generations ago, the the, the generation that didn't believe in 
medicine and doctors and that whole approach. But they believe in drinking tea and holistic approaches. I mean, I'm thinking, I know this is religious. I know we're, we're pushing in religion and, and sacrificing and stuff like that. But, but shouldn't we give it that kind of same attention where there are people who believe in holistic approaches? And you can hold that argument to the period court. OK. So. analogy with a, a, yeah. a holistic practices yeah. today as, as well. Um, so let's do this. I I had assigned uh, um, Patricia for the, the parents, Ashraf for the department. Um, so let's assume the case gets called and whatnot. But I'm going to open it up to you others because I think we're having a very good discussion of the issues around this case law as well. Um, so why doesn't um, Patricia first tell me, um, assuming I'm the Superior Court judge, right, um, if you could just do your procedural, Patri Patricia, uh, how did you file this case? How was this case before me? There was a 51A filed, and then a 51B followed up. Keep going. <laughs> you take it all the way to me, <laughs> the Superior Court. And then so, so uh, DCF, why are you here? What is it that you, you know, how is it that you filed a petition in a trial court, a, 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 the Superior Court Department of the Trial Court of Massachusetts? What kind of case is this? How is this before me, Superior Court judge? Well, it was one thing, it was 51A vacated because it was not adequately supported. Okay, yeah, but you're getting to what your argument is. Can you tell me procedurally how you're here? Somebody help her. This is exactly the procedure of the Kabul case. The Kabul case that I gave you is not a medical neglect case, right? So how is it that the petitioner is here, Richard? Uh, I'm, I'm gonna give a step. Uh, 51A report, then the 51B. Uh, okay, report. don't go all the way back to that. Tell me, if you, if you only have a minute, you know, a few minutes. You're before the Superior Court judge on just an oral argument. There was right? an administrative it, hearing yeah. where the uh, go ahead. parents uh, a 51A was upheld. I believe they then appeal it to district court, and at that point, it, it, they can appeal to Superior Court. <coughs> you've appealed to the Superior Court um, because you've exhausted your administrative remedies. So you, you filed this petition in Superior Court, and what's the plaintiff's basic argument? What is it that the plaintiff is looking for the Superior Court to do? To vacate the 51? No. No. Overturn the administrative determination by the Child and Family Services role that you played in the past. Right, and why? On what basis? That, that it what's the what's my the standard before me? What is or, uh, substantial evidence? Give me the whole sentence, Ash. Uh, the standard review is that the court may set aside the decision of an administrative agency if it's not supported by substantial evidence. Okay, so now you're going to go back. As uh, Patricia started to, and Richard to, 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 to what the hearing officer heard, right, to make your arguments for and against the hearing officer's decision. And I can only overturn that decision, right, if that report of abuse and neglect was not adequately supported by substantial evidence in the administrative record. That's the burden, that's the legal standard before the Superior Court. So now I'll hear the arguments for or against that. And, it, and even though the case law, other than Kabul, is not procedurally on all fours, the case law that you have certainly um, goes to um, what we call medical neglect, for a better term, of uh, parents, who parents would call it um, the you know, right to bring up their children the way that they plead, so to speak, whether it's religious, cultural, or other reasons why. So let me hear arguments. Who wants to speak first for the plaintiff? For us? I have Patricia. Um, who else represents the uh, parents? Uh, Cassandra. Um, what 
case, what, let's do this. How would you differentiate some of the cases such as you know, In Re Macaulay or the custody of the minor cases, uh, Orina, uh, that, that have dealt with um, either, either a court taking you know, custody of a child uh, in, in, in order to order certain medical treatment against parents' wishes, or um, you know, hospitals or doctors again, you know, filing in order to get orders. So how would you uh, distinguish those cases, Sandra? Um, I would just distinguish those cases on the basis of severity. Um, okay. Just these All doctors, right. not only did they testify as to like the conditions led to the diagnosis, but the severity of it and you know, and basically let the judge listen it. So for example, Macaulay. Yeah. With the, the, the um, trial court uh, authorized a blood transfusion. Blood transfusion. Um, the child in that case was believed to be suffering from leukemia. leukemia. So are you saying that you, it can be distinguished just because that case was uh, more serious? Severe, yes. Uh, but I did yeah. hear from the department, and I guess we'll hear more from the department, about the possibility of these symptoms being something much but, more serious. But they're talking about the future. We're talking about what's at hand, at issues right now. I mean, for Macaulay, I mean, she was on her deathbed and that's what the judge said. Listen, parents do not have unlimited parent parental control. We have to step in when it's in the case of Macaulay to save her life. Um, so they did factor, they did uh, evaluate the parents. Do you remember or do you have in front of you any of you, the, the, the uh, five <coughs> factors? Uh, Les is saying yes, so uh, he's nodding for us, so why don't you give us um, the five factors that the, the lower court had looked at in that case, and obviously the SJC upheld. They the, are the age the of age the child. The age of the child. So Jamil in this case is how old is your client? Okay, the child's age. Oh, ten. <laughs> All right, go ahead, Lester. The risk to the child's health if the treatment is not administered. So how would that factor apply in terms of, you know, again, at the time that Jamil was sick, the risk to the child's health if the requested treatment was not ordered? Because it, uh, uh, in, in the uh, previous scenario, you were the nurse, and you were saying what he should have been doing, what the parents should have done. Yeah, I, I agree with the department of DCF over there that uh, Richard, that... Uh, so was the risk to the child's health a great the risk? risk? Is, was it minimal? Uh, well, do we wait for the child to become severely ill before we decide routine treatment, antibiotic treatments, it's the 21st century. Or to get better as he did. What, what did you say? Or oh, to get better, yeah. Uh, Joe, you have your hand up. I'm just gonna too. simply say that, that in this case, there is a condition present that the child is, is ill. He has a, what they defined as strep throat, conditioned upon his health problems and you know quite frankly uh, the parents weren't taking any proactive steps to get the child the medical care that he needed so the, the department in this case felt as though they needed to step in and uh, you know ensure that the child was uh, you know valuable Oh really? Because that isn't what's before me. <laughs> <laughs> We're in Superior Court, not the Juvenile Court. Well, just for the purpose of receiving medical treatment, but he would still remain with uh, physical custody with the. With you the haven't parents. gone that far. All we've uh, the only reason that this case is before.
before me is because the parents appealed the administrative decision of that support the, 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 that was the initial support of the 51A. Just so as in Cabo, uh, the, the department, in fact, it looks like the department is ready to close the case because these parents are not, are not willing to work with the department anyway, and there's no emergency right now. Um, that's why I asked before, you know, and, and I heard from Pat Patricia that the reason why the parents, you know, are going through this expense is the concern that it can happen again. But isn't there enough in this case? John? Um, you represent the parents who now have uh, uh, been the subject of a 51A that's been supported, and they called you, I know we're going off for a second on the spirit court argument, but, and they called you and said, she, you know, that, that, that they're not gonna take my kid or anything, but I got this notice that this 51A was supported. What does this mean? Should I go further with this? How does this affect my rights or liabilities? Other than it could happen again, and that's certainly a, a, a reason as well. But what does it mean to have been supported? Why do your clients, and, and why, and then we get back to the argument now, and, and why did Cobble take this case all the way up to the SJC? It went from DCF from a 51A, as you guys wanted to start, to 51B to support, to administrative review, to Superior Court, to the SJC. That's a lot, and again, that's you're paying an attorney for that. You don't have a court appointed show. Simply, simply put, it's a graduated system, and ultimately, if they were to win on appeal here, I mean. Essentially, be reversing that decision back to to the basic steps. I mean, certainly there'd be some reforms that would be in place, but it's a graduated system. Yeah, system. I know that, but I'm asking why do plaintiffs do that? It's, you know, I, because it costs money to go through the system, John. Well, I, I think um, in the case uh, Cobble, you know, it's the same situation here. It's a question of this is the parent's philosophy, or this is how the parent does these things, and, and, and in fact, it's coming into conflict with the states. So is the parent doing it for principle? Uh, uh, yeah. And because it's going to recur. It's a principle of the matter. Yeah, it's like if I don't stand up for what I believe in, how I should raise my child, which is a constitutional right, then then that means I'd be giving, uh, basically parents would look at it as that then I'm giving, you know, the state authority and control over what I do inside of my own home and, and how I raise my child. But right now, I'm not looking really for an argument. Okay. Well, I, I, I'm, I'm looking for, this is the reason why I went to an attorney to appeal this. Richard? I think, what I've been saying, I think there's a potential someday, if it continues or it happens again, that there could be criminal liability for the parent. If the child did get sick and ultimately died, could there be a charge of you know, involuntary manslaughter brought up? I believe that's one of the things that they have to look at as parents. Patricia, you said before it could happen again. When it happens again, when <coughs> they've already got documented evidence that they're already in once. the central registry. Right. Whoa. Right. You don't want to be there ever, ever, because <laughs> now you've got a history in the system. And even though DCF has gone away and said, "Okay, fine, he's okay now," but we still supported it. Too bad. You want to say, no way, right? Ash? Because if you overturn the administrative hearing, they have to start all over again with the 51A report, and they're not in the system anymore. Central registry, once you're in that system, you know, the next call, you're already there. And, 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 uh, and it, go ahead. No, it's just to yeah. say, just, just also that probably DCYF in that case is probably going to be less likely to bring forward the same case again if they if they lose. I if mean, they lose. Yeah. Oh yeah. Reality based. Right, right. Yeah. Jamil comes, you know, you 
one this case to me the six six months down the line, um, maybe maybe. So get back to some of these cases. Uh, my colleagues. Uh, in terms of just that that um, balancing when the child might be in more danger than you know what what is the parent's prerogative to you know to treat whether spiritually or holistically etc do you know what i'm saying john yeah i I mean, this is a case that doesn't have a, really have a clear holding, but I thought it was one of the most interesting cases, the Charlene case, where there were just so many reports over three years, and they never supported the report, and the child was, was being horribly abused, basically came in for the last report in a vegetative state, so it had so much head trauma that, right, you know, mm -hmm. and the question was whether to... Uh, you know, shut off the um, thing, the machines that were keeping her alive at that point. And um, the father tried to get involved and tried to become a de facto parent. So at that point, what the court was saying was kind of, was he wanted to get some control over some of the, the um, another child, but he, he, he obviously either knew about it or was a part of it. And, the, and I thought that the court was trying, the court didn't make a holding saying, mm -hmm. You know, we don't have to. We don't. We me we messed up here. We didn't get to this in time. But they they did say at the bar, at the in the last paragraph of the case, kind of like that. You know, this case it does it kind of does stand for. Um, we're doing this this way now so that other children will be protected in the future, and that parents can't get involved when there's you know. It's a little bit of a different case, but it, it does involve this idea of. You didn't think the abuse was bad enough to support it, to support the report. Well, what can be the consequences of not supporting the report? They can be very bad. Yeah. Now, you know, that case, and I'm looking at the list that I had here, um, along with the Tuchard Minor case, um, again, were cases where um, the court is looking to, or the court may end up um, affording custody to someone else, typically the department in order to order that a child get medical treatment. The other cases are a little bit different in when Macaulay, Rena, again, deal with hospitals directly going to get um, uh, you know, orders from the Superior Court for special treatment, uh, you know, blood transfusions, et cetera. And then you have the Twitchell case, which is a criminal case. Um, it, but in many ways, the Twitchell case is a little bit similar because in the Twitchell case, the parties were what religion? Christian Scientists. Christian Scientists. And so, were they? What were they doing in terms of treatment, Richard? Um, in terms the of the parents, what did the parents? The son died of peritonitis, and they were doing spiritual treatment, but they relied on a, a common law two seventy three one. Exactly. That says basically parents can't be held liable if they're relying on spiritual treatment. Exactly. So the, those parents were using a practitioner in an analogous way to the Babalao in, in our case here and relying on that as a substitute. But in the Twitchell case, they even had um, a statute in their favor that said that they couldn't be charged with neglect for treating their child with prayer. And here we've been talking about when do you go too far? When does, you know, Jamil get so sick that his, ear, ear, you know, his um, eardrums burst? Or it, are these flu-like symptoms the beginning of something horrible? It could even be leukemia. Leukemia starts like that. Looks like that. Um, so even though the Twitchells are relying on prayer, and it looks like an out in terms of, oh, they don't have to take their child to a conventional medical practitioner because the statute says they can. Um, their child dies. 
the child died, and they was then charged with involuntary manslaughter. Patricia. Why wouldn't um, the school, the nurse, or the school itself even try to make communication with parents to see if they would be willing, because of the, the uh, strep throat, to get him treatment for that? So right. in other words, with just kind of like a mediation type thing before they do a 51A, see if right. the parents could be amenable to doing some type of treatment that would satisfy them. Mm -hmm. good, good point. I Richard. believe in the facts in the case. Uh, this way, Joe, now? Oh, no, no. On this case? Go I'm ahead. Sorry, yeah, I'm sorry about yeah. this case. Mm -hmm. I believe that the DCF investigator actually states that the parents aren't amenable to change their religious decisions or anything like that. She's discussed it, and they won't change. But that, that's it, goes to DCF, as opposed to before. The like, school, you're the talking school, about the school. The initial okay. discussion. Like a, a school uh, adjustment counselor, et cetera, that it, like I would think that the other people that would try to make an attempt where there didn't seem to be any other problem, right? Except for right. medical issues, mm -hmm. okay, and then maybe even get them in contact with a medical practitioner that could understand their religious background and just explain that the severity of the possibility of strep throat and how it could compound him health wise in the future. That's what is so sad about the everything else are good parents, love their children, you know, no physical abuse, no emotional neglect, you know, it's they're basing everything on their religion. The uh, no blood transfusion says that they're horrible witnesses. Um, it's very sad. This was the point I was going to make earlier, Your Honor, that we have to respect. I kind of came down off the bench now. I'm like, <laughs> who walks off the bench to talk to those little child clients. We have to respect the medical establishment. I mean, you're talking about a sense of balance, but yet- And that's one of the, and you, you know, those, that three parts, the state's interest, maintaining the integrity of the uh, medical profession. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're going to exalt religious belief and you know, de diminish, make make de minimis the medical establishment. That's not in balance. Right. Anybody did, did anybody follow the Twitchell case when it um, anybody know about it? Um, in fact, you have two very famous cases here. The Twitchells, um, the, the the Christian scientists treat their child with, with prayer. They didn't know that what he had was an obstructed bowel. That's what he died. You know, um, so that's why I'm saying the flu, the flu, you know, how do you know it's the flu? It could be, you know, something else. Uh, e even though they were charged with um, involuntary, um, they ended up with something like probation, you know. Again, this is a sad, sad case. Technically, yes, they may have fit within the elements, and you've all had criminal law of what involuntary manslaughter is, you know, reckless disregard, blah, blah, blah. Um, the custody of a minor, and I gave you three cases that were actually the same case. It was Chad Green, this young um, boy that had leukemia. Um, his parents, um, that was not a religious uh, um, exemption uh, um, argument that they were making. It was sort of, this is the way we want to treat our child. No chemo, chemo, you know, is really, you know, hurts the body, et cetera. Um, and they, um, got into these uh, different treatments of a drug called Laetrile, and natural, blah, blah, blah. And, uh, you know, the doctors were looking to give him, you know, when young children have leukemia, um, and the statistics are quite high um, on how well they do with, you know, chemo, with chemotherapy and, you know, um, bone marrow and all of that. So, um, the, um, Greens didn't, you know, they didn't want him to go through that. And so it went through successive appeals. They even went to the uh, dist the federal district court, that's the Green versus Truman case that I gave you, um, and tried to argue a constitutional argument as well. Sadly, what happened is they actually took him and fled to Mexico, and he died. Oh, wow. Did they get charged for that? No. 
No. No. So uh, there you have it. We're finished with medical neglect. Um, obviously, as most of these subjects, there's a lot more to it. Um, but all we can do is you know, touch on them in the course of this class. And notice that I, I have yet again a revised syllabus to the snow. Uh, so I sent that to all of you by email. Yeah. Which of you got it? Okay. So just changing the timeline. I, I, I changed. Yeah. Yeah. We're still going yeah. to so, do so, all the same cases. Just so next timeline. week we do um, adoption. We start. Um, actually, I'm doing on on Tuesday. You can start reading the. Is this the new one? Yeah. Okay. Um, on, on Tuesday I'll do an overview. Okay. But what you what you should probably do is read the cases anyway because on Thursday we're going to just go Jim really quickly through a list of at least 10 or 12 quick cases here, that, starting with Hugo, ending with uh, Iona. Um, and then the following Tuesday, the second, we uh, finish up the adoption cases. Then we do a little, um, uh, the taking of Logan Marr, it's a, a video thing. Actually, I'm, I'm probably going to do it. Uh, send you a uh, exercise on that. And then week 11 is our mock hearing. Week 12, we get into the uh, children requiring uh, assistance for these two chins. Uh, week 13, our juvenile delinquency, and we're finished. So that's the new updated syllabus. So it's adoption for Tuesday. Adoption for Tuesday, yes. Thank you.